So now you also had some interaction, interactions, at least at arm's length, with, with Escher. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I read was that you and, you and your father had been interested in Escher's work, and you worked out with him the ever-ascending staircase, which, by the way, yeah. seems to me quite similar, especially to the music in Bach's third Brandenburg Concerto, which, and I talked to a musician this week about how Bach managed to make this continual ascending spiral that yes, never there, really there goes is, up. That's true. There is a thing like that. Yeah, yeah, right, yes. So, and then uh, you sent the drawings of the staircase to Escher. Well, the story was a little bit longer than that because I, I had been at this I was a graduate student, I think in my second year, I can't quite remember. And I and a colleague went to Amsterdam to go to the International Congress of Mathematicians, which happened every four years. And at this congress, I happened to see one of my lecturers, and he had a catalogue which had one of these Escher pictures. Mm -hmm. And I said, what on earth is that, you see? And he said, well, this exhibition in the Van Gogh Museum by this artist, M.C. Escher, never heard of him before. I went to see the exhibition. I was absolutely blown over by these pictures. One in particular, I think, was called Relativity. And I came away thinking, gosh, that's amazing. I wonder whether I could do something a little bit different that I hadn't actually seen in, in the exhibition. And there, so I tried to make a construction with bridges and roads going in possible ways. And I simplified it down to this thing that people refer to as a tri-bar. <clears throat> I've seen the tri-bar. And... Uh, I showed my father. I mean, I didn't know that there's this uh, Swedish uh, artist called Oskar Reitersvard who had done things very similar earlier. Mm. But, but I actually didn't know about him either. But anyway, um, and there are other uh, artists who've done things like, if you look carefully in, in the old, there's a Bruegel which, which has a, a picture of gallows and it, it's joined up differently in the top. From yes, the I've seen that. I've seen that picture. Yeah. So there are other people who had played with these ideas, but I hadn't quite seen it in Escher. And so my father and I wrote an article. He, he, he developed this. The staircase was his, actually. Mm -hmm. He was designing buildings, and then he produced the staircase, which went round and round. And we decided to write a paper on this. We had no idea what the subject was, what journal did we send it to. So my father said, well, I happen to know the editor of the British Journal of Psychology, so let's call it Psychology. <laughs> so we sent it to them. And they accepted it. He said he thought he could get the editor <laughs> to accept it. They did, and this was, we gave reference to Escher's, the catalog and uh, to Escher's exhibition. And then my father had a, con a, a correspondence with Escher, with letters going backwards and forwards. And then I think I was in, driving in the Netherlands for some other, as a conference, I think. And I was curious, and I, when I was reasonably close to Escher, I phoned him up. I got the phone number from my father, and he was very nice, and he invited me and my then wife to, uh, to tea, and, uh, and he, I just had a chat with him, and he, he sat at one end of a long table, I was the other end, and he had two piles of prints, and he said, well, this pile, I don't have many left, I'm afraid. And he pushed the other pile to me, choose one. <laughs> So I sort of went through these things, and I picked one out. Pretty hard to choose one out of all that. And I chose one called Fish and Scales, which mm -hmm. he was actually rather pleased because he said, well, most people don't understand that one. <laughs> so I felt a bit flattered by that. But this, I then gave him a set of little pieces of just one shape, and... I, I gave him a set of them and said, well, can you tile with those? And then a little while later, he wrote to me and said he'd seen how to do it, but he wanted to know what the, the underlying principle was. So I did. I went afraid I was a very bad correspondent. It took me a little while before I got back to him. But I showed him the, the, what it was based on. And on the, the basis of that, he produced what I believe was his last watercolor, maybe even his last picture, as far as I know, a thing called... Ghosts, which is based on, on this. Uh, it's the only tiling, as far as I know, that he ever did, which is what's called non isohedral. You see, you, usually he did per periodic ones, but they're periodic in the strong sense that if you find a shape, the next time you see it, it has the same relation to the pattern as a whole. So you could move this one into that shape, 
and the whole pattern goes with it into itself. But the one I showed him was what's called non-isohedral, that you can have different instances of the shape. So this one has a different relation to the pattern as a whole from that one. And so you, if I move this one into that, I can't bring the whole pattern along with it. So you have two different roles that the shape plays. And the last one of his pictures ha showed this. Hmm. So I'm, I'm curious too, so this, about, about two things now, I'm interested in why you're so fascinated by the relationship of a geometric shape that can be arrayed in a variety of different manners to this underlying problem of mapping. I, be, so you're reducing, uh, you're reducing or establishing a relationship between the problem of mapping a large terrain to the utilization of like very stringently defined, what would you call them, the representational systems? Or the, that's a geometric form. What, what is the geometric form conceptually? in relationship to the problem of mapping. Well, you had a shape and then you have certain rules about which fits pieces will fit next to it. But there's certain freedom in that rule. You could put this one that way or another way, you see. And, you know, if it's, just, if it's a shape which very clearly has to fit that way next to it, then it just repeats, you <clears> see. <throat> but if there's some freedom as to what the next one will do, then you might have to make that choice and certain choices will run you into difficulties later, and other choices maybe will allow you to continue. Is there a relationship that, between that and what composers do with music? Because, I mean, there's a certain, <laughs> no. well, there's a certain yes. repeating determinacy in music, but obviously a composer just doesn't take a pattern mm, and repeat mm. it indefinitely. They take a pattern, and the pattern seems to allow for some choice in mm. movement yeah. from that right. pattern forward. Well, maybe, I don't know. I mean, it's... A, it's I mean, what makes a piece of music into a good piece of music? I mean, I have no idea. That's a, that's a much deeper issue. Well, we do know we do know. know a bit about it. We know that if it's too simple and repetitive, mm -hmm. it, you your you interest get gets exhausted. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, it gets yes. stale very rapidly, sure. and then mm -hmm. as it moves towards purely unpredictable, it yes. becomes indistinguishable from noise. So there's some place in between there, and you could probably move on that place yeah. where you get some ultimately harmonious relationship of predictable form and, well, something like the play of novelty that seems to me to be analogous to that possibility of shifting the shapes in this tiling problem. I mean, I think music is tiling something. Yeah. It's a representational form. Okay. No, there's probably some connection. It's just that music, I mean, there's so much more freedom as to what you do. You, you see, with, this, with these tiling shapes, it's forced on you that you, either it fits or it doesn't, you see. With, right, with music, right. it's much more subtle. Right. So I would. I right. would hate to make too much of a comparison. A leap. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, one more question along that okay. line. Yeah. Now that that triangle you made. Yes. Now, what's the relationship between those paradoxical forms and the tiling problem? Not much. <laughs> because they seem to be. They. There. I mean, there's a play of of representation and image there. I mean, one of the things I've been wondering. I looked at all your diverse contributions, and I thought wow, there's a lot of things happening in a lot of different places, but there must be some, there's something that's not random. <laughs> there's something at work that's a kind of a uniting principle that might be, I don't know, it might be the problem that you're trying to solve in some, in, in some deepest way that's uniting all these elements of exploration and interest. I don't know, you're asking too hard a question. I don't know. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. sometimes, there, I don't see any overriding principle. I mean, there's a sort of thing, you know, something feels right. Now, why, do, why does it right. feel right? I mean, that could be something very subtle. Yeah. No, it may be wrong, too. Oh, well, maybe, see, maybe they that, are wrong. That, yes, yes. So but see, it seems to, to me that that also is related in some important sense, psychologically, to that notion of understanding. You know, the feeling that it's right. It's, it's like it's interesting that it can be wrong, but it's also interesting that it can be a predictor of, like I had a student, a student, she was very creative, and she would come up with hypotheses that were damn good, mm. but she was more creative than the typical psychologist, and I don't say that in a denigrating way. I mean, she was more like an artist than a researcher. And then what she would do is spend like six months 
writing out the algorithmic pathway to that conclusion, even though that is not how she derived it. But she had a pretty unerring ability to jump forward to the right place with her intuition. And it's something like, I think it's something like a deep form of pattern recognition. You know, you don't need the full pattern to infer what the pattern might be. You can have a sparse representation of it leap to what might be analogous to a tiling solution, I suppose. And that, that seems to be something related to the accuracy of intuition.